Welcome to Tessera's Nerf Room. So there are a lot of Nerf series out there. In fact, there is so many that they cover my wall in random colors instead of it just being one uniform color of one particular Nerf series, which is how a perfect world would probably go because good heavens, there's so many different Nerf lineups. I don't know where to begin and where to end. But out of the tons upon tons of different series and lineups that Nerf has put out, there's always been one that stood out to me. One that most people I know would probably claim as the definitive Nerf series of the modern generation. I am of course talking about N-Strike Elite. This series has proven itself to be the most iconic series that Nerf has ever made, even more iconic than the original yellow N-Strike guns. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean if you pick up an Elite Series blaster and you run around with it, everyone within a 50 mile radius will know that it's an Elite Series blaster and not something by any other company or in any other line. And that doesn't just have to do with the colors. These blasters are iconic. These blasters are well known. But how did this happen? How do these blasters go from just being good blasters to being so iconic and so well known that just looking at one can define Nerf as a whole? Well, let's try and find out. <laughs> It's been a very long time since I've done a Nerf series review, ever since I did the Modulus series review, so apologies if I'm a little bit rusty on that, but I'm going to try and split this video into several different categories, and each category is going to consist of one particular topic that I want to cover when it comes to talking about the Elite series, and all the reasons why I think that Elite is the most iconic and definitive Nerf series that Nerf has ever put out, as well as why Elite 2.0 will never ever be a definitive nerf series even if they end up making the best blasters out there there's a big reason for that because it would have happened by now let's get that out of the way first and talk about what i think the most important factor of a nerf series is its launch and the thing about nerf launches is that they can range from the absolute best of the best to the absolute worst of the worst and we have seen the best of the best and the worst of the worst in just the last couple years and that's actually kind of hilarious to say First of all, let's take a look at what I consider to be the best launch ever, the N-Strike launch. N-Strike had a perfect launch in my opinion. It released with one blaster, that blaster being the Unity Power System. A blaster that had so much stuff put into it that you could just buy one and be set for a 1v1 nerf war between your friends and family. And that was really all you needed, just one big Unity Power System. It did everything. It had a 6 dart air tank shotgun launcher thing, it had a giant nugget rocket launcher, and it had a single shot pistol. Everything that you could ever need for like a basic loadout put together. You have the primary, you have the specialty, you have the sidearm. The Unity Power System was quite possibly the best received blaster ever when it came out. It was so cool that everybody wanted to have one and then it disappeared from the earth and now they are basically impossible to find. And if you can find one, good luck affording it. The point is the blaster or the combo pack as modern day nerfers would call it, introduced everything you needed to know about N-Strike. It showed you what the blasters were like, it showed you what the blasters were capable of, it demonstrated its FPS, and it gave you a nice competent platform to start building your N-Strike collection off of. And that pretty much set the stone for where N-Strike would go, being a super popular series with super popular blasters and super innovative blasters like the Recon, the Barricade, and the Alpha Trooper. All of those blasters still being well known to this day, and some of them still being well collectible to this day. I happen to have the Alpha Trooper and the Recon. I don't have a barricade, but one of these days I might get a barricade. Who knows? But then how did Elite launch? Because Elite launched very differently to N-Strike. Elite didn't just have this one big behemoth of a blaster that came out. Elite did something differently that is arguably better. Elite essentially took the most tried and true blasters, the most popular releases of the N-Strike series, brought them to the modern day, and gave them way more firepower. I am mainly talking about the Stockade, the Alpha Trooper, and the Retaliator. The Alpha Trooper being a direct bring over from the N-Strike series with a 
new paint job, the Retaliator having a name change, a new paint job, and new attachments, and a new paint job, and the Stockade being the same thing as the Barricade, but with updated firepower, new paint job, and a really cool stock that you can use with it. It was also pretty quickly after they made Elite that they introduced the Rough Cut, which was the first blaster to use smart air restrictors, which you could consider a blessing or a curse. It was also here where they started expanding with more types of blasters, like introducing things from the past in new shell designs as well. Like this basically being a Maverick, but with an entirely new, better looking, better designed, swept back shell design, which improved the kind of functionality of the blaster, gave it a bit of a nicer grip, in some people's opinions, and most importantly, introduced slam fire to anybody that wanted it. This alone would have set aside Elite's success, and Elite was very successful. And I think Nerf knew that this was one of the biggest factors, which is why they tried to do it again with Elite 2.0. The only issue was that Elite 2.0 copied the same iconic blasters from the Elite series, except that instead of giving them upgrades, they kept the FPS the same, and made every single thing about them all worse. The biggest example I can think of is right here, the Rough Cut versus the Warden. The Rough Cut is a very nice blaster that everybody knows about and everybody loves, Everybody hates this thing. Everybody doesn't like this thing. This thing is one of the worst received blasters ever, not just because it looks a little bit different. I mean, the looks don't really have anything to do with it. I think the Warden looks okay. I think the ergonomics of the Warden are okay. I think the prime smoothness of this blaster is okay. The problem is the plastic quality, the fact that you can't open it without breaking it, and the fact that it doesn't like to exist. It loves to break. Just ask phase one foam. For new patches, I've waited about six months to get this one just to see if it actually fixed it or if it actually changed anything so first prime here we go are you kidding me i broke it i you i'm so sorry guys you son of a And this trend was not just limited to the Warden. This followed with every single Elite 2.0 release, except for maybe the Trio, because there were no glue holding it together. You could actually just pop it open if you popped the clips. But the point is, that led to Elite 2.0 being what I possibly consider as the worst series launch ever made, right up next to Nerf Ultra. I do think Ultra is a little tiny bit worse, but I will explain that in a completely different video. But we're not here to bash on Elite 2.0. I'll do a whole other video on that. We're here to talk about original Elite. Another one of the factors that I think has to do with why it's so iconic and so definitive is its color scheme. And I'm not talking about like the Elite XD, the white and orange style blasters. I'm talking about the original Elite Blue, like this blaster is in right here and this Rhino Fire is in right here. This is a very, very iconic color scheme. And anybody who looks at this will immediately know that it is an elite blaster. There is no doubt about it. Now, I think that this kind of just generally runs through with all the definitive nerf series having a uniform color scheme, rather than spreading off to all sorts of different colors. It is also why I don't really consider Dino Squad as a sort of normal style nerf series, because the color schemes of those blasters go all over the place. There's some that are green, some that are red, some that are blue, some that are yellow. It doesn't really matter. Elite all basically had the same color schemes for every single blaster. And I think there's a reason why the Elite Blue is the best color scheme that Nerf ever chose. And I do think that Elite Blue is the best color scheme that Nerf ever had, even better than the original and strike Yellow. And this comes down to a few different factors. The first is its simplicity and the contrast between the colors. Elite Blue color schemes have five colors mainly. Black, blue, white, orange, and light gray. And this blaster has all five of them. So it's got black on the grip, dark blue on the main blaster, white details, an orange barrel, and a light gray priming handle. And that is basically one of the most key features at making a blaster instantly recognizable, is having a simple but very easy to recognize color scheme. And the color scheme is exactly the same among all the elite blasters. And rarely, if any situations exist where the blasters strayed off from that color scheme, I have no idea. I 
think that Elite Blue is the perfect color, not just because it's physically iconic because of all the blasters released in it, but also because of something I like to call the sky effect, where because our eyes are so used to seeing blue in the sky, anything that's blue just has a sort of more visually appealing tint to it than something like a red blaster. For example, if you look at the Mega Mastodon over here and then look at the Rhino Fire directly after it, your eyes sort of feel a sense of relief when you look at the Rhino Fire because of the dark blue rather than the bright loud red. And that also bling brings me into my other point, the dark blue is just easier on the eyes. It's more easy and aesthetically pleasing to look at a blaster in this dark blue color scheme with these sort of bright vibrant accents on them than looking at a bright vibrant blaster with dark blue nice accents on them. Even simply switching the colors can make all the difference. Take a look at this XD Retaliator versus the original Elite Blue Strongarm, and tell me that the XD Retaliator is more settling on the eyes than the original Strongarm. It isn't. The darker colors on the Strongarm make it just a lot more visually appealing to look at than the bright, obnoxious Retaliator. Now, I'm not saying that this is an ugly blaster to look at, I'm just saying that it is substantially brighter than the Strongarm because this blaster is mostly white with some blue details, and even then, the blue is a brighter blue than that of the strong arm so it's really not a fair comparison the original strong arm is a lot darker and a lot more pleasant on the eyes and that's also why i think the original elite blue releases sold better than the xd releases not just because more people already had them for coming out sooner but also just because they're a lot more visually appealing and a lot more pleasant to look at on the eyes i certainly know that this is the case because i like looking at this rhino fire more than i liked looking at my xd rhino fire and if that wasn't enough evidence to prove my point, what about the actual last generation of Elite Blasters selling probably just because of the colors themselves? I know it's a ridiculous thing to state, but it could genuinely be true. The last generation of Elite wasn't received very well, but still some of the blasters sold relatively well like this one right here. And I think a lot of that has to do with the color scheme. This color scheme is iconic, it's pleasant on the eyes, and in fact this blaster right here expands on the original Elite Elite's color scheme by making the blue into a sort of pseudo bluish purple and it is a super beautiful blaster to look at in person. This blaster is very aesthetically pleasing to look at and it is why I will never ever paint it even if I were to modify it. I think the Infinis looks wonderful and I think that the colors alone have to do with a blaster success if only by a little bit. The next thing I want to talk about is originality. How Elite sort of brought the weird and wacky world of nerf blasters into to a new generation by taking the funny gimmicks that were released back in the End Strike series and expanding on them to make them more advanced, more complicated, more hilarious, and even more fun to use in a nerf war. Like this Hail Fire, for example. The Hail Fire is absolutely ridiculous, but it has a very interesting concept. All the mags are on the blaster, and that's something that they did once and then never touched on again because this blaster just didn't sell too well, but that's not the point. The point is that this was original, and this wasn't the only thing that was bringing new cards to the table. The Cam ECS-12 was another one. The Rapid Strike was another one, being the first dart shooting, double flywheel, fully automatic, magazine-fed blaster, and the Rapid Strike was very interesting. The Cross Bolt being an actual band-powered blaster. The Rhino Fire shooting through two different magazines. Nerf blasters in the Elite series tried to keep the gimmicks and also make them useful for actual combat in Nerf. Most of the time they ended up flopping, but there were some of those few select blasters that sold really, really well, like the Strife. The Strife essentially just set out to make the Raven as tiny and usable and compact as possible, and it succeeded dramatically. The Strife sold exceptionally well, even to this very day, it is still selling well in the Modulus Strife, because the Strife is just a tried and true design. It works, it's comfortable, it's moddable, it's efficient, it's good looking, it's easy to use, and there's really nothing to complain about it, unless you get into the really nitty gritty details like it having trigger locks. But then again, every blaster has trigger locks to some capacity, because it's just a safety concern. Hell, even some of the flops in the Elite series like the Titan CS50 are still iconic for various reasons. These designs are well known. These designs are definitive. If you look at 
like this blaster, you know what it is. You know what series it came from. You know what it does. You know what to expect. It is a definitive Elite Blaster. And that is another thing that I think that the Elite Blasters did so much better, and that is their physical designs. Elite Blasters have gone through many, 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 many different designs, but if there's one thing I can say about every single Elite Blaster out there, it's that every design released is iconic in some way, shape, or form, even the bad ones. Like, for example, the Surge Fire here did not sell well at all. This was a blaster that was received mediocre at best and terrible at worst, and yet it is still super iconic to look Look at. It has a charm to it. These blasters don't just rely on their color schemes to add charm, but their designs help as well. They are simplistic, they are good looking, and they always have one or two things about them that set them apart from every other blaster, and that is the camouflage prints that are on them. This blaster uses tiger camo. By combining different types of plastic together and different types of plastic molding together, the shell offers this reflective, good looking tiger camo design. And if it's not tiger camo, it's the sort of traditional square camo pattern as seen on the strong arm. If you pick the strong arm up and you look at it, you can see these square camo designs done in the exact same way as the tiger camo from earlier. This makes the blasters look even better in person than they look on camera, and it provides a charm that you don't get with any other nerf series because even the Elite 2.0 blasters didn't copy this tiger camo. By extent, they didn't copy the regular camo either, but that's not really the point. I think that all of these factors together made Elite a definitive nerf series. And really, you can take a look at any of the things that I've just talked about and make them their own reasons for Elite to be so definitive. But there is one more. One more that sets Elite apart from every other series, and that is its accessibility. And Strike Elite was released in a generation where commercials were still a thing for Nerf blasters. Each blaster would have its own set release date, and then commercials for these blasters would be seen on Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and whatever else. The point is, you would hear about these. You would see these. There would be videos posted about them on YouTube, videos speculating the actual like commercials themselves and talking about how good the blasters looked. And then on that set release date, when you rush down to Walmart and you look for these, there they were would be every single time. If not at Walmart, they'd be at Toys R Us, or one or the other. They were always accessible, and you always knew just where to find them, so these blasters were super easy to get into the hands of consumers. This, mixed with everything else I've talked about today, is why I think N-Strike Elite is the most definitive and well-known and iconic nerf series ever made. But what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. I would love to hear your opinion as to what you think is the most definitive nerf series, and I would love to hear your opinions on why. With all that said, thanks for watching. Bye.